So, oh, well, we'll get started. Is this bright enough for everybody can see, or I need to adjust the height of it? We're good? Okay. So, first things first, this is kind of the bare bones of our team at Baylor, of course, it's a lot more people are involved. But, of course, Dr. Gonzalez is our surgical director. Am I? Well, that's lovely, whatever. <laughs> So he's our surgical director, so Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Aldo Rafael, Dr. Themisakles Homo Georgiakis, Dr. Juan McCannaford, um, they all do the actual implants of ours. We do have four surgeons. And then on the medical side, we do have Dr. Shelley Hall, Jan Kuiper, and Brian Hardaway. So the goal is for one of them and the coordinators to come around once per day to make rounds on the patients uh, once they are absolutely over here. Now, to get a hold of one of the coordinators, this is three of us, myself, Megan, and Katie. Um, we are the, the three people in the, from Baylor who do all the education, the outreach, the ongoing clinical um, support for these patients. To get a hold of us, 214-820-6856, uh, very important number. During regular business hours, that will call the main office number to get the administrative assistant who's manning the phones. But then after 4 p.m., that will call whichever coordinator is on call. Now, you may get a lung coordinator, you may get a pre-lung, pre-heart, post-lung, or one of us, since there's 11 of us, and we all split call. And it's a question that they don't know, they can then in turn call myself, Megan or Katie, um, on our personal cell phones, the issue that they don't know, because obviously if you're a lung coordinator, they don't do this stuff every day. Um, and it's really bad, like you have to go to ER, and then of course we just go to ER, and I live a mile down the road, and I just come on in, and we handle it. And again, of course, our office number, again, right here, 820 and we are actually over in that new cancer building, so we're on the second floor is our main office over there. So a couple of key points about the HeartMate 2 LVAD, and I'm going to pass around an actual device. This was in one of our patients until he got a transplant, and then we have Thoratech clean that, that thing on up and send it on back to us. So, what this is, if you know anything about LVADs at all, this is a continuous flow device, meaning, now right here I have one actually on a mock loop that's actually working. So, now of course this tubing is not inside of our patients, but just kind of a representation of the way blood, in this case, the water flows. So at all times, the LVAD has a fixed speed, okay? That being said is, older generation LVADs used to be pulsatile, and if they were to fail, you could hand pump them. Well, on this device, it'll spin from 8,000 to 15,000 RPMs. So, luckily, they don't just fail. Never have one just fail just out of the box, ever, in over 16,000 implants across the world. But if it does, there is no hand pump, and because of all the metal, uh, pieces inside the actual bat itself, and it does work on magnets, patients cannot have an MRI, okay? But luckily, most patients also have a defibrillator, so nothing new for all of our folks in the first place, okay? Now, of course, these devices, these are assist devices. They are not taking over the complete workload of that left ventricle that is weak and damaged from whatever reason their heart failure may stem from. So. We want whatever heart function the patient does have, and then with the LVAD, kind of like, like, like a booster almost, to get a normal cardiac output. So, <clears throat> depending on the patient, when you go to feel a pulse, whether it's femoral, radial, carotid, whatever it is, you may or may not feel a good palpable pulse, depending on if they have enough um, ejection fraction left to actually open and close their aortic valve. So, the normal automatic blood pressure machines may or may not be totally accurate. So that's why we go with the augmented mean arterial pressure. So we'll talk about that here in a, little, in a few more minutes. Now, because of the way this device works, there are no valves inside of it. So if we do have pump stoppage, we can have backwards or retrograde flow go through our pump. So we've been asked to most the ascending aorta, the blood goes out the aortic valve into our anastomosis and backwards through the pump. And that can cause, you know, of course, serious complications like flash pulmonary edema and all that kind of bad stuff. So, number one rule of all LVADs is keep them plugged in and keep them operating as much as you possibly can. 
So let me ask if, if yeah. you interrupt, but so no. I understand exactly where is it in the, the circuit of your cardiovascular system that it's getting plugged in? The, I'm sorry, the LVAD, where are they, so they're doing it post, where are they putting it in? So, oh, there's a, there's a good slide right here. I mean, so, right here in the bottom of the apex of the LV is where they uh, cut a hole and they, that was called the core, pull the core out. The actual pump itself is actually in the pre abdominal, and it always does that. I'm sorry. So it's actually in the pre-abdominal pocket right here, just below the diaphragm. And then, of course, inflow cannula, pump itself, outflow to the ascending aorta. So then from there, over the cardiac cycle, the output of the actual pump will vary. Of course, when we contract it in systole, you'll get a little more blood through it, heart relaxed diastole, a little less blood, but you'll get an average flow on our uh, controller right here. It'll tell you. We'll go over the controller here in just a few moments. And then, of course, over here you have a nice, good radiographic representation of a, one, one of our folks. Kind of shows you what's on the inside. Obviously, median sternotomy and their drive line comes out here onto their right side. These are all cardiac tele leads. Okay. So all this thing goes under the diaphragm somehow, or yes. does it stay mm -hmm. in, under that under mm -hmm. the diaphragm? Okay. So when Dr. Gonzalez is implanting these devices, not only are they getting full cardiac access for like, you know, a valve or a cab or a transplant, they're going a little bit deeper down to here and make what's called a pump pocket. When inside their muscular tissue, that's when you heal up around it. And some patients have a lot of referred pain on their left flank and their left shoulder, but it's not cardiac, it's referred pain from where that tissue is going to heal up around that actual LVAD. And we see those kind of long-term in people who are you know, ideally three to six months if that pain goes away once everything's healed up on the inside. But if you listen to a patient, if you listen about like right here, just below that, the PMI area, you'll hear a nice good hum that's right over where the pump sits. And the patients can't tell, I mean, they won't feel vibration or anything like that. So don't really hear a bruise, more hum? It's a constant, just mm, all the time. If you don't hear a hum, that's bad. <laughs> that means the pump's not on. So, well, just like right here, you kind of hear this pump we have on the table. Uh, you hear that hum? Uh, it's about the same thing. Now, of course, obviously, it's a lot louder it's on this table. Like, if you're walking past one of our patients, you won't hear the hum unless you put your ear to their chest or through a stethoscope or anything like that. You won't feel a vibration like that. But if you Listen, anywhere in their abdomen or thoracic cavity, just, mm, just nice. So no heart sounds? You'll still have heart sounds. Oh, okay. Because the normal physiology of the heart is still working. The atrium, the ventricles, all the valves, except for the aortic valve, all have to still function. So um, they can have mitral valves, mechanical mitral valves, tissue valve replacements, all that kind of good stuff. We don't like to have mechanical, atri uh, mechanical aortic valves because we're not always ejecting from a clot on it. So sometimes if they have a mechanical aortic valve, we will replace it with a tissue valve at time of actual implant. We have several folks that do have mechanical mitrals. Mm -hmm. The tricuspid valve, we don't really, it's on the right side, not a big deal for the LVAD. Okay? So we talked about, we'll talk about here in a few moments too, how to change the power sources. Uh, there's a lot of new safety features with this new controller, and we'll cover those in a few moments. Uh, but the trick is to only have the patient do one power lead at a time. That being said is because that way the pump will always be with power. If the pump has zero power, then the pump's not going to work. Just like if you have no gas in your car, you're not, you'll be walking. Well, this thing runs out of all juice, the VAD will stop, but then they still have whatever intrinsic heart they have left. Obviously, if they're coming from an LVAD, their heart's not very good. So, I've had folks who were not compliant, they last, you know, an hour to get here. Had some folks who were so not compliant that we actually had to turn their, they clawed their pump off, and he's still kicking somewhere out in West Texas. But he would actually unplug his device for an hour a day and go for a walk on the block. And of course, he formed a clot. And we didn't replace it because he's not compliant. <laughs> so, all these folks, just so you know, they, everybody has plenty of batteries. Uh, these are the batteries right here, and I'll pass them around in the clips. For normal usage, 
you got to have two of these, and they're about a pound and a half a piece. Uh, and they last right around 10 to 12 hours. And so, here we go. If you want to take them out, there's a little button, pardon me, on the bottom. Worthless luck, like a, if you have guns. Yeah. And then, of course, the controller that they wear around their waist right here. This is the controller. It weighs right about two and a half pounds. So all told, they're carrying right under six pounds of equipment wherever they go. So they carry it all the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Different. Well, whether it's around their neck, in a bag, around their waist, however it is that the patient wants to carry their equipment, they can. Everybody has their own lifestyle management, lifestyle solution for that. I'll grab those. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll keep on going. So the design is actually really pretty simple. Uh, there are, like I said, there are no valves. There is only one moving part, and it's actually inside the pump housing itself. It's all done by the electromagnetic motor. So as long as we have power going to the magnets, the impeller spins and creates our blood flow. Okay. So what way it works is there's actually two rubies inside the pump, and then the blood plasma lubricates the ruby bearings and creates a near frictionless environment so it won't cause hemolysis or red blood cell de de destruction. So that's why we think these pumps originally they're designed to last at least three years. Now we're thinking seven to 12 years as long as the patient's device interface can last, because if it has a stroke or other medical issue, that causes the patient to expire, rather than, I've never had a pump ever just quit, and someone expire that way. So of course, all the motor driving control electronics are outside the body. This is what this guy right here is. This is the main piece of equipment, it is our controller. This at all times is telling the pump how fast to turn. And we set these in the OR in the clinic. So we're not going to be having you all doing echocardiograms and setting LDAD speeds. Should we have an issue, we'll inform up to Hardaway, Hall, or Kuiper. We can send them over to the clinic, do an echocardiogram, just for speeds. Well, there's certain communications that we know that we can adjust the speeds for. There is nothing on the control that you can do to turn the pump off or even change their speed. So they can't say, I'm going to go for a walk, I'm on. Make my pump go faster. They can't do that. It's a set speed for whatever it is. And everybody has their own set goal speed. So whether it's 8,000 or 10,000 RPM, it's all dialed in just for that specific patient. Okay? And then, of course, we do require external power source, whether it be the battery or this lovely cable right here into our power module, which they use at nighttime. So right now, I'm running off my controller off this 14-foot cable that's only giving power to my controller, and the controller is at all times telling the LVAD how fast to run. Okay? Make sense? Why does this in that circuit? So when you want to do a battery, all you do is you undo one of these at one at a time, and it's going to beep at me because you are taking power away from one side, and then you just plug it into your clip. And then you just get the other battery and do the same thing. So now you put it back. Mm -hmm. Well, if I had my other battery, I could do this one right here. Okay. But yeah, yeah, you just do it one at a time. That's all there is to it. So, okay. So again, this is our anatomical placement. Again, inside the chest, pumps inside, and of course it communicates through the drive line that actually exits the left side of their abdomen on my. Uh, X-ray here is on the right side. Dr. Gonzalez and his partners put them on the left side. And so there is a sterile wound care. It's, it's done just like a pick line or a central line dressing change, which we do train the caregivers to do. So it depends on what stage they're in their education. Um, they're already are checked off, or we'll come over here until the patient is checked off. So that way the nursing staff won't have to do it, unless it's just kind of falling off. But it is a sterile wound care. That way we can pre prevent infections from forming at the driveline side. Um, and then, which is a, could be a bad complication because we can't get rid of it. How often is that an issue? Well, here at Baylor, we actually have one of the lowest infection rates in the nation. 
the nation infection rates right about 15 to 18 percent. We said about three to four percent. So most of us, most other VAD centers don't mandate sterile technique after it's healed. We still do. They over over time they may, they can say sterile at first. And then after about six months, you can do it twice a week, then once a week, and then you just clean it with regular gloves and go. Well, we keep some sterile technique, and then we keep them doing that for their life. And that's why we're able to have such a lower, plus it's just, once you teach them one time, just keep doing it that way. Makes my life, makes my job easier, so. Um, one other question. One yeah. percentage of patients, they had to get rid of the device because it was infected. Um, We've only, I've been here for four years. I've only had to replace one device due to infection. Because okay. he let his drive line caught on a doorknob and he was running through, he slammed it <coughs> and it completely, like, completely ripped a six inch scar up to there. Oh. So his whole thing got infected. It wasn't because he wasn't taking care of his actual site, but because he slammed a door and caught his drive line and just ripped his skin. Okay. He was fighting with the old, with, with, it, with his wife. <laughs> I was like, just watch out for doorknobs, you fight. <laughs> so, patients ever become confused, a new issue? Are they sort of not a candidate for this anymore? I mean, so, if there's like a dementia onset before, yeah, we do do those screens for like, you know, especially in our elderly patients. Um, if we have a, if we think it's an issue for like neurocognitive testing. Because if you have dementia, you might fiddle with it, break it, whatever it is. I mean, we've done patients. We visited our eldest patient, he's 82 now, and he was excavated post-op day one into the floor on day one. He's moving faster than our 19-year-old kid did, mm -hmm. who had been in the hospital in a week. So, so you never can young. tell by age. I mean, it's all about patient's motivation. So the youngest is 19 or they can be younger? Well, the youngest that we've done, she was 17. It all depends on a certain body size. Because, I mean, obviously, if you're 4 foot 11, your uh, B BSA is like 1.5 meters squared, that pump probably won't fit inside. But if you're, you know, the general rule is like 1.8 meters squared is the general BSA that they want. So, I mean, most people, once they're passing to 16, do qualify for that. But we have had some, we have a little lady right now who just barely met the size criteria, and it's not crammed in there, but it's a it's a pretty close to being a tight, a tight fit. So yeah, there is a size requirement, and of course, as these pumps get smaller and smaller and smaller, you'll see them in you know younger and younger patients. You know, I won't say like like, like preemie patients or like that, but down in the future, 20 years, who knows? Do you have any competitions? Anyone else making? Oh yeah, there's the, the the big ones in the United States are Thoratec and Heartware. Heartware is still in, in their clinical trials, and their pump's a little bit smaller than that one. And it's a centrifugal pump versus an axial flow. It's just a little bit different the way you manage it. But there's still a controller, there's still a drive line, there's still batteries. No matter what we do, there's nothing right now where it can all be internal yet. We're working on that. That's pretty exciting. So. So going on with this pump, this is kind of the cut through right here. As you can see, this is the anastomosis to the uh, LV apex. Of course, blood comes in. This right here is the impeller. On the top right here, you have the two uh, magnets that actually spin the impeller that make the actual blood flow. Then, of course, the outflow bitter leaf, the outflow graft to the ascending aorta. And that's all it is. One moving part. As long as you get power to it, it keeps going. Okay. So these conduits are flexible. So this right here and here are flexible. So as the patient does heal, we noticed about five or so years ago when we had stiff conduits, as the patient's healed, the pump would shift and it could cause cracking. So they make them flexible now to allow some movement as the patient does heal up, okay? The big problem is, is that if the patient gets a whole bunch of weight and puts pressure on there, you can move the pump quite dramatically, and that's, that's an issue. So we still do the whole heart failure diet, <coughs> cardiac rehabilitation, all that kind of, to kind of manage their, their weight. Um, and of course, our pump output will vary over the cardiac cycle. So uh, it does follow the native pulse, and so as the heart beats, more flow through the pump, heart relaxes during the acetylene, 
less flow through the pump. So it is preload dependent and afterload sensitive. So if you have no volume, no fluid going to the heart, to the pump, same thing, won't work. If you have no blood going to your heart normally, they can't squeeze anything. So same thing, means volume, volume, volume. So these folks, they've had heart failure for a long time, are used to restricting their fluid intake. Once they've recovered, we take them off their fluid restriction. Drink all you want, because if you run your pump dry, you have a whole other uh, set of issues. Um, so, but we also need to manage their afterload, because if we have high blood pressure, these pumps will not override high blood pressure either. So we're aiming for a mean of total pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury. Because if, if we have a lot of afterload, squeezing down the pump, it's just spinning at, you know, 8500 RPMs, it doesn't know the pressure's high. It won't override. So we have a very tight blood pressure control. Now, so it means you're not giving these people Lasix anymore? They still need Lasix if they do, because I mean, if they have it in their ankles and their peripheral, not in their vascular system, then we still have to get rid of that fluid to reduce that SVR and the PVR and all that kind of stuff, yes. But you guys will be completely managing the diuretics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the doctors, you know, if you have any questions, always feel free to text, call, text or call to haul Kuiper or Hardaway. They're very good about getting back any kind of questions, or you can email myself or Megan. We can get a hold of them. We just call them directly. I mean, they have no problems if you just call and say, hey, Shelly, this is what I'm seeing. What do you recommend? Okay, we'll do this. And they're... So really, all the blood pressure, all the volume issues, they're going to be managing simply because... Yeah, I, I would hate to speak for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what they've kind of worked out, but I can definitely go and ask the hall when I see her. See, they should handle all that, otherwise yeah. be... I know over at um, BIR, Dr. Uh, Amy Wilson, of course they do a lot more LVADs. She kind of takes it on, and then she just tells them, well, this is what I'm seeing, this is, this is what I'm doing, so on and so forth. Um, so I'll have to reach out to them just to kind of verify, because I don't want to speak for them. Sure. So, but yeah, I think at first, you know, because we definitely don't want y'all to feel like you're thrown to the wolves, as it were. I mean, this is normal day stuff for us, but for y'all, it's a lot. I know it's scary, so yeah, for sure. But I'll, I'll ask it to Shelly, and uh, I'll try to Hall, and go, and go from there. Okay? Okay. So, of course, a couple of flow principles for this pump. Um, all this stuff is kind of uh, dependent on what the actual VAD is doing. So the, of all the numbers we have to go with, the only one that we do control is what speed the pump is going off of. So again, depending on their volume status, their health status, how, how active they are, the cardiologist will set it for a certain speed. Now, okay, now if we have a certain speed, like you know, it doesn't RPM, we may get three liters of blood flow per minute. If we're at 9,000 RPM, we may get four liters. So the higher the speed, the higher the flow. Same thing's true if we our speed goes down, less speed, less flow. Think about kind of like a car engine, the more RPMs typically, the faster you're moving along, you know, Highway 75. Of course, at 5 p.m., you're doing nothing, so. And again, the difference in the pressure across the pump, meaning the blood pressure, the higher the pressure, the lower the flow. The lower the pressure, the higher the flow. Kind of works the same way with our native heart. If you have really high blood pressure, your actual total cardiac output is going to be a lot lower. So it all the elevator works just like you know regular heart does work. Okay. So again, at any given speed, the increased blood pressure will decrease your actual elevator flow. Okay. All right. Now on our little screen. You can always tell what your speed is. So my pump right now is set for 8,200 RPM. I keep scrolling through here. Right now my flow is 3.5 liters per minute. This is based upon our speed and how much power we have to use to achieve that speed. So if you see this number right here, always, always know where the flow, the more power it's using, the higher the flow is going to be. It all kind of goes together. Okay? Questions on that? No? All right. So, to come for your own knowledge, we can do 8,000 to 15,000 RPMs. Now, no one's at 15,000 RPMs from our center. Our highest patient's at 11,000 RPMs. So, we saw it can go a lot faster than what it really has to. 
we can do flow anywhere from three to 10 liters of flow for normal flow with this device. And of course, the power is all measured in watts, and there's a what's called a pulse index, or a PI, which is the relative uh, measurement of flow, pulse, pulse flow through the pump. So as our heart contracts, relax, contracts, relax, there's a, what's called that pulse index. So the higher the pulse index on our screen, the more native function that patient has. Now here on my little water loop, obviously I have no heart, but say my PI or pulse index is 2.4. Now obviously if we're in a patient, that'd be a little on the low side. We like it four to six, somewhere in there. So they have a lot of contractility force, they may have a higher pulse function than somebody who has a weaker ventricle, who may be around four or so. Now what happens if your native heart decides to go into complete heart block? As long as there's blood coming to the pump, the pump keeps going. But it will be coming, like, you know, be coming at a slower rate. Right. So, I have had a patient who went into V-fib for three and a half hours. Drove from Corsica in his truck and V-fib three hours because his defibrillator had a dead battery. Went to the ER, we put pads on him, we shocked him, and he went home. And that was two and a half years ago. So at that point, the pump in his case, was able to support his whole system to where he could physically drive out. Of course, we said, next time, go to your local hospital. Don't drive to Baylor from, from Corsicana. But he did. So the LVAD doesn't really, yes, if you lose that atrial kick, if you're in AFib, BFib, or whatever it is, you'll lose that preload, so you'll have less blood to work with. But as long as it has some blood, it will keep pumping. So people can survive long-term VTAC, VFib episodes, or complete heart block, or whatever their dysrhythmia, dysrhythmia may be. Okay. Now, the majority of our patients do also have AICDs, so they just theoretically should be shocked or paced out of it, should that occur. Everyone who has Albert also needs AICD or no? Is it the That's a debate, because some docs say yes, some docs say no. If you have an ischemic event making your heart failure, so a heart attack, you know, years prior to, typically you're, you're going to get an AICD first. Uh, a lot of our younger patients who have an idiopathic, a viral, something like that, cardiomyopathy, we may put defibrillator in them, we may not, it just kind of depends um, how it goes. Like we have a young guy who's like our, our 19 year old, he's a viral cardiomyopathy, so his heart's not due to damage, it's just he got the flu last year. And unfortunately, it attacked his heart, so now he has an LVAD. But his electrical system is still fully intact, so he never had a dysrhythmia, so he doesn't really need one. Now, should he need one, we'd go put one in, but that's a more risk for infection, all that kind of stuff. So, but if they do have a defibrillator, it will shock out of VTAC, VFib, um, and of course, with the LVAD, it's two levels of safety for these patients. One's for electrical, one's a mechanical uh, function of the heart. Okay. So if pulse index is less than four, then we should be concerned in calling you guys? It all depends on how the patient looks and feels. Um, it can be as simple as how much are they drinking? Because again, if they're getting dehydrated, because a lot of folks, again, don't, are used to not drinking a whole lot. So typically, we try to hydrate first. But you can always call us too. Yeah, if you have a question, please call us. We'd rather a lot of calls versus no calls. You know, that's why we're here for, okay? Um, so typically if the PI is lower, it's because their ventricle cavity may be smaller and may need just simple as drink some more water throughout the day or maybe a small <laughs> fluid bolus. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the system. Now this is the older controller that sits down here. This is kind of what it looks like when it's all kind of put together with their vest. You got the two batteries on the side, and it looks kind of like you know pistols. Um, it's kind of what it is. The pump here through our drive line through our skin, attached to the controller. The controller then gets power from the batteries. So that's kind of the same thing for all all these elevated patients. And then when they go home, they get their home charger for the batteries and their power uh, module that they plug into at nighttime. We only make patients use the power module at night. If they want to be in the chair all day watching television, the Olympics, 
basketball, football, whatever it is, they can be on badge as long as they so choose to. But when they sleep, put them on the patient cable and the power module, it's just safer. And we'll cover the safety features in just, just, just a moment. Okay. So the controller itself, it's a microprocessor that delivers power to the pump based upon what we set the speed to. Okay. So again, the controller always controls the speed and the power, and it will also monitor and interpret what the actual device in their chest is doing. If there's an alarm condition, it'll alarm appropriately. Um, what was I oh, in the system too, there is complete backup for everything. So you have one computer chip that runs everything. There's also a redundancy safety backup one also, in case the primary one does fail. In the event also in these new controller systems, there's a battery right here that if we were to lose all power, no power in the battery, no power from here, the battery here will power the device for up to 15 minutes. And we'll show you all these alarms in just a few moments when we look at the alarm section. So there's always complete backup for everything, whether it's the microprocessor, there's two in there. If you lose all power, Battery in total power for 15 minutes, you just plug it back in on that kind of stuff. The only thing it cannot do is if we have um, irreparable damage to our drive line. If this gets cut, severed, and like that, the pump will stop. Now, obviously, if it comes out, you just put it back in, but it's not just gonna come out. We're gonna do a whole lot of steps, we're gonna cover all those in just a moment, also. Okay? And then just so you know, this is kind of really more for us in the clinic, it can record events. And so we can look back at the history and see what the pump's been doing in the past couple of weeks and months. But we'll do that when we kind of make rounds. We'll bring our little clinic screen over. We'll do all that interrogation if we need to make any kind of adjustment, anything like that. So on the front, a couple of things. Uh, there's only three buttons on the controller. Top one right here is your battery button. Everyone's favorite, the alarm silence. And then, of course, the one here on the, the big square is our screen button. So, if you press your screen button to go for the nurse's staff, you'll see your how fast it's going, how much flow you're getting, what our pulse index is, power consumption, and then the charge level of your internal backup battery. So, there's five presses. Obviously right here, if we're on batteries, you press that one time, that'll tell you how much fuel you have on your batteries. Then if you have an alarm, like if I, it's going to tell you on the screen what's going on. So if I hit silence, I silence the alarm for up to, to two minutes. So if I undo one of my power sources, now it's saying, hey, we've lost power over here, connect power. And that's all you got to do. You just grab your battery, back in. Alarm is satisfied, shuts up. And that battery button that you just pushed, that was telling me the power on the two portable batteries, not right. the internal backup. Right, right. If you're on, correct, if you're on two batteries, it'll test the charge from both batteries. Now, if we're on the patient cable and you check the battery button, it'll always be full because it's, it's always getting constant power from the power module. So this is only really used right here if you're on two batteries. And again, the batteries will last you anywhere from 10 to 12 hours. I have some patients I get, you know, roughly 14, 16 hours out of, a, out, of, out, of, out of two batteries. So they can go all day and then some. Well, so let me ask, mm -hmm. while they're, we have a patient over here, and let's say they're in the pod and we're not doing any activity with them, you'd have them to the main unit? No, yeah, if they're you'd awake. Have, you'd have them do the battery pods. Yeah, just, we like them kind of used to being on batteries, because, I mean, eventually when they get home, Last thing we want them to do is to feel like they have to be, you know, in their bedroom, hooked to the power module all day long. So what we have to do is, once they're out of the ICU or on the floor, to be on batteries, unless they're taking a nap or sleeping. It's the only time they have to be on um, their power, their power, their power module. So the same thing too is like you go home, you don't want me to feel like you're tied to your bed all the time. We want them to live a normal, happy, healthy life, which means being up, be mobile, taking care of stuff for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then they go for a long drive, like drive from here to Florida. <laughs> if they have power, sure. Have power. Mm -hmm. 
So their batteries would last 12 hours, and well, they do, can charge it. Right. Well, they do have eight batteries, too. Oh, okay. So we do get them plenty of batteries. Okay. And most people probably don't want to drive that far in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but if they did, you know, this is their charger right here. They can charge this, plug into their car. Car charging? Mm -hmm. Yep. All that kind of good stuff, yeah. And then, of course, it's kind of hard to see here. There's lights on, but all your indicator lights on the sides right here, which is kind of, I know it's kind of hard to see. We'll cover those. Just a moment. So, with all this, can they fly? Oh yeah. Uh, I want. I'm actually. Patients say that if you tell them you have this device, they'll actually take you to the front of the line because it takes them TSA. They, you can't go through the little scanner or the little thing you do like this on. Or well, even the wand, it's not recommended. You have to go to the little room. You have to be hand, unfortunately, you have to be hand searched, but it's just kind of the way it is. And we give them letters. Um, and we encourage people to fly. I mean, you know, if they want to go to Florida, I want to go too. I'm, I'm here in Dallas, so I can go. So, on the batteries, like I said before, pass them around a moment ago, they're real simple. There is a button on the battery, um, it's right here on the front little white part on the left side. It'll tell you the charge of that battery alone. So if you want to check just the battery, you can. Okay? And then obviously, button right here, battery comes out. And then when you put it back together, there's two little red arrows on the side. If you line them up, they hear a click. <clears throat> it only fits in one way. If I'm doing it wrong, it's not going to go in. So Tell all my patients, if you have them to force a connection, you're doing it wrong. It should slide in nice and easy. And it's not hard to do. Okay? <clears throat> so obviously, you know, these clips, we tell them to inspect the clips daily. If they get dropped on the floor and cracked, throw them away. We'll order new ones. Everybody does get spare clips also. They get total four clips. They only need two in case they were to drop and they were to break or whatever. <coughs> and then, of course, on the fuel gauge on the battery and the controller, even just always know that even if you have five lights on the battery, it's only 80%, 200% power on that battery. You could have 92, you could have 84. It's all a rough estimate. But we tell our folks, you know, when you come to about, you know, two lights, 20 to 40%, start changing out your batteries. Of course, they're going to be here, they won't be, you know, out in the community just yet. But plenty of time to get new batteries, plug them on, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <coughs> all right, patient management. The fun stuff. So, if we cannot get the non invasive uh, blood pressure monitor to work on them, we may have to do a Doppler. And what I recommend is just getting the Doppler, pump it up real tight, putting the probe on the radial artery. And then when you hear a constant flow, that's going to be their augmented mean arterial pressure. And that's what we're looking for. Whatever it is to keep that vein, or sorry, artery open all the time. Okay. And again, we always want to, we always want that less than 90. Ideally, 70 to, should say 70 to 85. Um, but I forgot to fit my slide. Only because there has been shown in certain long-term studies, anything 90 or above has an increased risk for CVA and strokes. So we want to keep that pressure under control, okay? So if we can use the automatic cuff, well great. You know, if it spits it out, it's probably pretty accurate because we tend to run our pumps a little slower, it's for more pulse function, it is probably accurate. If you can't... Do you want to, first time when we get them, you, you want to compare to make sure that what you can. automatic is all yeah. good? Yeah, yeah. So if you can, if you pump it in the automatic one and it says, me, their map is 80. Well, then you want to go back through the Doppler and it's the, you know, the regular manual cuff, put on there and kind of see, you know, yeah, for sure. Now, the thing is, if y'all do a lot of pulse oximetry for your patients, because of the way the, the pulse works, it may or may not pick it up. And so, I have a lot of times the PACU nurses call me because their pulse is in their, like, you know, 83, 80 in their, on, on their SATs, and they're freaking out. It's like, what's the patient doing? While he's sitting up, he's drinking juice. He feels fine. Well, is he pink? Is he warm? Is he dry? Obviously, if he is, then he's getting perfusion. Just because those little pulse oximeters don't always, can't always pick up a good pulse. 
But again, since we do run our pumps a little slower nowadays, they are again, they are fairly reliable, but I wouldn't just put the end all be all on those devices. I walked in one time through the PACU. My poor guy had a problem on each ear, on his forehead, three fingers, a couple of toes. <laughs> Just like, they all spent about a thousand bucks in pulse ops probes for no reason, because none of them worked. So, and if it is so bad, you know, and especially in the PACU of the ICU, we will use the cerebral uh, pulse oximeters, but those are pretty expensive. I don't think y'all want to pay for those, so, yeah. Just so you know, pulse oximetry, if it's in the 88s or lower, just kind of see what the patient is doing. Are they mentating okay? Are they pink? Are they warm? Are they dry? Well, that's probably just an inaccurate because of the constant flow versus a pulse, time, pulse flow in their, in their bloodstream. Okay, so again, patient assessment. You always want to, of course, assess the level of function of the device. Of course, the big thing is, of course, is keep your connections always intact. Number one, drive line. No drive line, no pump flow. Okay? And then, of course, power. Without power, the pump will not work. For the nurses, staff, and everything else, you just kind of scroll through the here, press the button, you'll see your numbers. Okay? We're not going to go into a whole lot of pump theory, what this really kind of mean. Um, if you have a question, always feel free to call us. You can always come over here and assess it too. I uh, know for the first couple of patients, we'll be coming around um, and doing some patient education. Now, the, the first patient, I believe her husband, is checked off fully on all, of course, the wound care and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but we'll still come around, probably more towards, I'm not sure you'll schedule here, typically at VAR, we come around towards the end of the day, about between three and four, kind of make rounds, make sure y'all don't have any needs or anything like, like that. Okay? And of course, um, we'll go over once we're actually here, I can show the nurse's staff what the dressing site actually looks like and how we immobilize that, that drive line. Because we don't want that drive line getting tugged on. So when they get up and start being more and more mobile, the thing you want is to get caught on a wheelchair or a bed handle or wrapped in some sheets. Just always be very cognizant of where this drive line is and minimize damage. Of course, always mental status. If you know at noon they're making sense and at 5 p.m. they're the Queen of England, what's going on? You know, what's changed? All those kind of things. 12 lead EKGs and echoes. Um, just say no, there is no such thing as an LVAD rhythm. It's in that charted many times in the ICU throughout my career. So if they're in VTAC, VFib, AFib, third degree, a winky box, whatever rhythm they're in, that's what their heart is doing. So if you do have to get a 12 lead EKG and it prints out something, it's going to be accurate. This will not interfere or affect the way the heart's rhythm that it is in. And of course lab work, if there are potassiums too, and that's pretty bad. Replace potassium. <laughs> okay? So now if in the event you do have to defibrillate or and or cardiovert, just go ahead and do so. Um, you do not have to worry about doing anything with the LVAD. Unless you crack your chest open. If you have to do that, that's bad news. Go to Bugsy. <laughs> so, this pump is designed to function with defibrillation, cardioversion, all that kind of stuff. Whether it's from the AICD or it's from pads. Just don't put the, your, the pad on my driveline, please. Just put it on the back or on the chest. Do what you gotta do, 120 joules, go for it. All ACS protocol except for chest compressions, but what we do recommend. So no chest compressions. Correct. Unless we say go for it. Now in my career of working LVADs for the past eight years, I have never once done compressions on an LVAD patient my entire life. Even in people that have had complete ventricular standstill or anything like that, LVAD's still working. We only do compressions if we can verify the LVAD is not working. Now this is our chest. On the, you know, click on the 12 lead and it says V-fib. The LVAD says no flow, listen to the chest, don't hear a hum. Well, obviously, at that point, go ahead and do them because if they're going to die, well, at least you gave them a shot. You know what I mean? So, we only do compressions if we can verify uh, mechanical pump failure. But again, I've never seen it ever happen before. Because the concern you have is that you're going to dislodge the where anastomosis into the heart and the more so that you're right. More so it's the outflow graph because it runs right under the sternum, and 
that was my senior nurse, I used to love doing compressions, and you break those first couple of ribs, and you might puncture that outflow graft. Well, then all of a sudden, you got four layers of blood flow going from the pump into the vessel cavity. Not only do you have, you know, B-type B-fib, but then you also cause cardiac tamponade. A whole other slew of problems. So it's kind of a way to think about it is you still do all your ACLS protocols, you know, shock, meds, all that stuff. If the LVAD's working, well then, don't worry about the actual outflow. The flow, because it's, it's going to be flowing blood, as long as it has blood going to the actual pump. Yeah. How many times accidentally, uh, you know, this end has come out? Never. Anyway, I've never, never heard of ever happening. Never dislocated? Nope. No, because no, once, it's, once it's actually in, uh -huh. there's a whole sewing ring from a doctor. They put in what's called a sewing ring first. Okay. Then they core the hole, and then that attaches to the actual sewing ring, not the actual myocardia. Okay. So if the sewing ring is sewn in place to the heart tissue, it attaches then to the actual pump itself. Okay. I've never had a pump ever come dislodged. People okay. always. People always want to ask them, yeah? No? No, that's a good question. Is, is hemolysis an issue? It is. Mm -hmm. So that's more of a long-term issue, like if for some reason they have high blood pressure or they have some degree of ventricular ventricular recovery, we have blood clots forming there. But then you're going to see, like, you know, your typical hemolysis signs, like, you know, sclera's going yellow, they're going to urinate, look like Dr. Pepper. Or it might just be frank blood in the urine, anything like that. If that's the case, then of course transfer the ER back to Baylor. We can do some things, you know, what the patient needs to have done. So I tell my, my, all my all my patients, whenever you go to the bathroom, always look at it. If it's, it's like Coke, that's bad. Call me, you know. If it's really dark and concentrated, they're going to be dehydrated. Push more fluids. If you see bloody stool, black tarry stool, GI bleed, we gotta fix that too. So, so as a general rule, I sh their crit should be stable. I mean, there should probably, be a base, or is there like probably a one, hemolysis yeah, that always happens? Not, not, no, not like that. They're more likely they're chronically anemic due to chronic disease more than anything else. And so typically we're not really too worried about a lot of blood transfusions until their their uh, HH is below like eight and a half or so. Hematocrit probably around 25, somewhere in there. So eight and a half, 25 on the hemoglobin hematocrit. If they're a nine, yeah, okay. Just kind of see what their trends have been doing. I got a lot of folks walking around that you know hematocrit at 28 and nine of hemoglobin. Okay, and they feel fine. But I should expect it to be stable, and if it drops. It yeah. should be assigned to me to either hemolyzing or they have... Or just acute anemia. blood loss or, you know, maybe they're just chronically anemic and not making more blood cells. So, I know the patient's coming over here. She is not, I don't think, had any blood products for a long time. And she's really young. She's 30-ish. So, she shouldn't be having this. Hers was a very acute onset. For that, she was perfectly healthy and all that kind of stuff. Um, so she shouldn't have that chronic disease anemia. Okay. Then of course, if for some reason you do want to crack a chest, we're going to put that outflow graft. But again, not doing that here. It's kind of fun that we do that. It's very exciting. So again, if, we're, if we are in cardiac arrest, you know, for whatever reason, we are going to follow all the current ACLS algorithms and medication protocols. Okay. If we do have to do chest compressions in your medical nursing judgments, then of course we always want to do a stat chest x-ray to assess the level of function, make sure we're not tamponading inside the chest. Okay? But of course, if you have an issue that emergently, always, always, always call us. We can always help out. Again, I live a mile that way. I can run over here and help out. I live real close. And if you want to massage your heart, yeah, okay. Again, so all our folks are going to be on anticoagulation. Of course, uh, we only do Coumadin and aspirin. We don't do Pradaxa, Eliquis, all those medications. Good old Coumadin. It's a pain, but it's a good drug. We aim for a typical range 1.8 to 2.5. Now, obviously, if we have a history of atrial fibrillation or mechanical mitral valve, 
that 2.5 might be more towards the 3 range, or if they're a, a known bleeder, GI bleed, we may be more towards the 1.8 range. Everyone's kind of fluid somewhere in there. Okay. And we check it typically about twice a week. Will you guys be managing the Coumadin on them? Again, I'll have to defer to the doctors to kind of see what they want to do. Um, if their INR is like 2, then typically even as an outpatient, we will check it again the following week. We don't do them every day. Otherwise, they get all poked up and everything else. And plus, you're on Coumadin, it takes about three or four days to get a whole new level in the blood, of course. So, Can I interrupt you for a second? How yeah. long do you think? I'm just going to tell these guys what to expect. Uh, we're almost... Almost done. Oh, yeah, okay. Another okay. So they can, so they can hang out for a minute. Then. Yeah. Okay. So um, alarms. Now these are the only things. These are the only four hazard alarms that we're going to have. One is a low flow. If you have a low flow alarm, that means we have low preload, or there's a blockage somewhere in the um, outflow system right here. Okay. If you have a low flow alarm, there's nothing you can do about it here. You go to Bumsy, and that's it. And so like if we have a complete kink off of our flow right here, that we have a clump form, the LVAD will try and fix it at first, but it's all going to be internalized. And then at some point, it's going to alarm it. There you go. So we'll see right here. Flashing. So you hear that pretty good, right? Yeah. All right. So it's going to say low flow alarm. It's going to a little timer on the bottom. It's going to tell you what to do. Call hospital contact. <laughs> That's if you want to call ER, EMS, or call 911. I'm not sure how y'all do it. Go to the ER, notify us, notify Dr. Hall, Piper Hardaway, whomever. Okay? Now, if this were to resolve, resolve our low flow situation, the alarm goes away. So, flashing red hearts, a hazard alarm, of course, that's bad. Okay? How long do we wait to see if it'll self-resolve? Well, I mean, if it, if it occurs, you won't see it. Like, I had a guy who's actually, his heart's recovering. We may take his pump out. So he called me because he's had a low flow alarm. So he's walking around Baylor yesterday. Mm -hmm. But now he's in the ICU because we're trying to evaluate whether he should take his pump out or not. But he's having constant low flow alarms, but they resolve before that 10 or 15 seconds before it actually alarms. Oh, okay. So it gives you a little bit of time to kind of go from there. But if you see that, then it's been happening for about 10 or so seconds, call us, let us know. Okay. Typically, if it's an acute thing, it's simply a volume thing um, due to small ventricular size or, or cavity. You can always push fluids. No one's going to be upset if you put a whole lot of fluids in these people. Okay. Push fluids, a liter, two liters, we'll give them Lasix, they can pee it out later. It's easier to put fluids in or take fluids off, then put fluids in. Now the thing is, is on top of my controller right here, you'll see a little green circle arrow. That means the pump is actually running. So if you see green arrow, red heart, the pump's running, just that's when we have that low flow. It's still flowing blood, it's just we're less than 2.5 liters per minute. So it's not a no flow alarm, it's a low flow. And that's hard programming in the, in the system. I can't change that for, you know, one liter, two liters, or whatever it is. Okay? So, again, it's going to be a continuous tone. Um, if I have the patient, my guy who was having low flows yesterday, he's walking around the hospital having low flow alarms, but he feels fine. So, we'll probably take his pump out, perhaps. We just don't know yet. <laughs> now, the next one we're going to have is our drive line disconnected. So, obviously, if the drive line comes out, you gotta do a whole lot of steps. You gotta check on the back. You gotta flip this door down. You gotta press the red button, and you gotta pull. And then, of course, you'll see here, it's on step, red heart alarm also, and then a red flashing light next to our drive line port. If you see that, it's gonna say connect drive line immediately. All you gotta do is there's a little black line, a little black line in the back. It's a little black mark right here. You just line those up. Push it in, close your trap door, LVAD starts automatically. Now that should never happen unless someone's messing with it. Okay, so that red heart alarm you should never see, but if you do see it, plug it back in. Okay? Next hazard alarm we have is the no external power. 
So if we're trying to help our patients get out of bed and they're doing a power source and we have no battery power, so again, constant audio alert. We have a flashing red battery, our green lights on, meaning the L bed itself it is still spinning. But now we have our patient cables are dis the electric here are disconnected. So all it means is we've lost all power, but due to we have our battery back here in the back, we have up to 15 minutes of power, and all you gotta do is just take one of your leads, and it never, it never matters which lead you do first, plug it in, and then now we're back down to just one yellow light, meaning the white lead is still un unplugged. Use your favorite battery or patient cable, and plug that guy back in. Like that. That's all there's to it. Depends on that. Nope. All right. We always plug and unplug the black. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. It does not matter. If you read the, the manuals, they'll say white one first. It does not matter. Just do one at a time, black or white first. And then, of course, if we have a low battery, if we're on our patient batteries, the battery will flash red right here. That means you have five minutes of power left on two batteries. Now there's going to be a alarm that happens before that, which is called our yellow diamond alarm, which means you have 15 minutes of power left. So, and all you do is give a low battery alarm and just replenish the batteries. Or plug them into your patient module. So when a yellow alarm happens, will that battery part be always red or will it be yellow? Are you talking the yellow about one happens first. Okay, where? So what happens is on our little di right, a little fuel gauge, there's a little yes. diamond right there. The diamond there. Okay. It's yellow first, and that means you have 15 minutes left. The patient ignores that. When you have five minutes left, the red battery goes off. Okay. If you ignore that, then your patient battery here takes over, and you have that constant tone again. So there's a lot of levels of safety built into it. It's going to let you know if you're running low on power. So for the advisory alarms, there's really only two things you have to really worry about. One is replace your power, the other one is contact us. So yellow alarms are going to include power leak disconnected, just a moment ago. There's going to be a yellow indicator light next to your disconnected power leak, and it's going to beep once per second. If the alarm is beeping like this, it's not critical. Just hit silence and then go on during your power source change, okay? If you have a yellow wrench, it will be done here at the bottom, that's something completely different. It could be a controller malfunction, it could be a drive line malfunction, it could be a lot of other things. If that occurs, call us, we'll come, we will swap the controller out. That's why everybody has two controllers. So they have one of the primary and they have a back controller also. But since you all probably won't have a whole lot of our patients, we're not going to hold staff responsible for swapping controllers out. You let us know, we'll come in, we'll perform it, and we'll go from there. So you're doing the wrong order, not that it'll kill somebody, but you have to undo the drive line, and so the pump will stop for a moment of time if you're nervous and you're all freaking out. Versus I don't do it all the time, but I train on my mock loop all the time. I just, all right, it's good to go. Okay? So, of course, we're going to do these real quick. Oh, let's get one. <clears throat> so here's our yellow diamond alarm. It's a low voltage, meaning you have five minutes of power, or sorry, 15 minutes of power remaining. It's going to be a slow beep once every four seconds. You can silence the alarm for up to five minutes. And all you do is you replace the power to one at a time. That's all you got to do. Once you get a new power source on, it's going to stop that yellow beeping alarm, and you go, you go, go from there. If you have this right here, and it says controller faults, has a yellow wrench, it's a fault with the actual hardware right here. Never had, a, had that happen before, but if that were to happen, that's what it says call hospital contact. And again, we'll come over here, myself, Katie, or Megan, we will swap it out. We'll go from there. Now, if that happens, this, this is when the backup system that controller takes over, that you know, hardware fault. So if you hit silence, It'll silence it for up to four hours, which will still have that yellow wrench. And as long as that green light in the circle is on, your LVAT is still running, it is still flowing blood. 
That's why there is a built-in backup system in the controller itself. Okay? So this one's going to be for uh, the battery backup <coughs> fault. So that's the battery backup going to be inside right here. Now again, this is only if we ever lose all power. It's not actually running the device unless we have no power. So if that one were to false, again, call hospital contacts. We'll have to come in with a spare battery because they don't get just the spare batteries for the internal controller. We'll have to bring that with us. We'll just replace it. So any yellow wrench, just call us. Luckily, I don't know how it happened before. Okay, and then of course, low speed advisory. I won't go into too much detail about this, but it's one we have to have our, we have to reprogram the actual LBAT itself. So if that happens, again, call us, we'll bring our module over, we will reprogram the controller. Okay? It can be done in bedside? Yes. Mm -hmm. We plug it in to the cables right here, and we actually put the monitor into the power module, and then it communicates through our 14 foot patient cable right here. Okay? And then, of course, if we have a drive line fault, something's wrong with the drive line. Whether it's a short to a shield or it's a breakage in one of the circuits, there are six circuits. You only have to have two for it to actually work. So, again, it's all redundant. But if that happens, we'll have to call Thoratec to repair the drive line. I can't even, I'm not, I can't even do that part. Or if it's so bad, we'll do the OR to a whole plug and replace it. But we've never done that before. It's never had that happen before. So. And then this is more just for if for some reason I don't install the battery before they leave the OR, which I would do, so you won't see this one. And then of course if I don't set the clock on the alarm or on the controller. But again, in the OR, we set the clocks, so you shouldn't see this one. Or you won't see that one. Alright, just for a quick review, for any given alarm, always insert connections, power, drive line. If you don't have those connected, the system will not work. So, drive line engaged, you got good power. One of the ones, always check your power. Check your patient, assess the patient, what's going on. And of course, if you need assistance, 214-820-6856. That's it? Yes? So when the first patient comes over, will someone, will you or someone mm -hmm. be, you know, like, we'll let you know what time the patient's arriving, yep. so you can be here to mm -hmm. help set up. Now, I'm not sure how they do the transfers over here from Bumsy. I don't know if they go by non-emergent transportation or go up like a tunnel under the road or... They'll come on yeah, care flight. Yeah, She'll come on care flight. Care flight. So yeah. we'll work out to where we can come with them once we know they're coming. I haven't heard an exact date or time yet, but yeah, for sure. We'll come over. We can do get everything set up for the first you know, couple of patients. Yeah, no worries. But everything else, you just plug in the wall, power the patient, and he, she, whoever it is, down the road is going to be good. We keep them in pod for first. Well, this patient it requires to. I mean, you can talk to that, Dr. Raver. I mean, that was a discussion. She needs to be in the pod because she is on a ventilator. She's getting dialysis because of her medical condition. She needs to but be. Generally, in there. they don't need to be in pod. Not necessarily. She, the, Dr. Hall told us to look at the patient as a whole, not necessarily at the bad. Yeah, in her case, it's going to be she's on dialysis. She's had a lot of, she's had a very long, rough hospital. I'm not sure how much y'all know about she's her. Got a yet. Wing back. Yeah, she's got a yeah. Wing. She had some right heart dysfunction. She was on ECMO for a while. Dialysis. She was on CVHD. Um, so ideally, we hope that patients don't have to come here, but sometimes we have to. So, um, and then eventually, hopefully, transfer over to BIR, which over there they're more accustomed to all this stuff. Let me ask you, what are kind of the, so I've heard GI bleeds is a big thing to worry about, obviously, if somebody who's on Coumadin's, that's... So what it is, is if you have the non pulsatile flow, you get a lot of more AVMs for some reason. And of course, the whole Von Willebrand's malformations, um, and the whole, all that stuff. So, they have these communicating AVMs, GI bleeds, that's why we do run our pumps a little on the slower side to get patients more pulsatility that, that the GI gut likes to have. We haven't noticed anything, the biosystem, that the brain, everything else doesn't care about pulse flow and non-pulse flow. For some reason, small large intestine likes pulse flow. So we turn them down a little bit, so if they're a known bleeder, we'll 
reduce their aspirin, reduce their warfare and goal, and probably take the pump down as we can, give them more pulsatility, reduce GI bleeds. But then if we do all that, then of course we got to manage the GI bleeding with heart failure symptoms. If we turn the pump down and they're full of fluid and can't walk and can't breathe, we tell them, well, which symptom do you want to live with? Bleeding or breathing? You got to kind of bounce out. That's where a couple of our older folks are. So they're trying to decide, you know, manage their GI bleed symptoms for those their known bleeders. And unfortunately, we can't test for that. So we, until we put a pump in, there's not really a test you can see if you're going to bleed or not after an LVAD. Somebody had told me that each one of them has a GI doctor that's already assigned. Is that... We do if if they're if they're above a you know the age of a you know, yearly colonoscopy we will go ahead and do that and get them referred just for a their evaluation colonoscopy but if they're like 19 years old you know, we won't scope them just for just just to go scope them now if they have a GI issue we do have a certain few that not that we we like everybody but we have certain few that are more comfortable with these things Dr Hamilton um, that has a lot of our our LVAD patients. Dr. Anderson, all those, kind of, all those guys. I don't know if you know them or not. Yeah. So. If somebody were bleeding, obviously we transfer them back to pump C. Mm -hmm. so we'll do a colonoscopy, and then Actually, Katie, Megan, or myself will have to go sit and gel up with them and monitor the dad. It's part of our job. We sit in the back corner and do nothing for a good hour and a half. And so. generally on those patients, you first. You do what you normally do, stopping the Coumadin, you stop anticoagulants. If they're within a certain range. Um, if they're bleeding like that, and they're, we'd be more worried about having enough clot forming the pump than a GI bleed, because you have know, clot forming, you have a CVA, you can die from that. If you're GI bleeding, we'll go there and they'll cauterize the bleed and give blood products. So typically we won't stop just for that. So, so, so okay. Typically, we only stop it if they're if it's a plan like OR procedure, like the gallbladder out, or if their INRs way out out of range. Otherwise, we don't stop their anticoagulation. Going for like a heart cath for their transplant maintenance, Kuiper Hall and heart away, stick them, and they bleed a whole bunch. You know, what we have to do is we don't clot our pump off. Are there any other? Problems they have other than potentially infection and bleeding, bitter. I mean, there's always going to be the bleeding. The big ones always going to be the bleeding, the strokes, infection. Mm -hmm. How frequently do we see strokes in LVADs? It's a lot less nowadays, but um, once you're at about the three months out of surgery, you're kind of past all the acute phase. Um, I'd say probably less than 5%. So, what would be the reason for strokes? Is it like thrombosis or? Depends on its etiology, if it's a bleed or it's a if it's, or if it's embolic. Um, but it's the same thing you do, just send them back to the bumps the ER. Um, depends on where the, if it's a clot where it is, or they got a place of coil, and interventional radiology, we do all that stuff. Again, Katie, Megan, and I will go with the patient, and we'll monitor the VAD, which really means I sit in the OR and do nothing for three hours. <laughs> I've never had an LVAD ever just stop or have an issue in any kind of procedure. Mm -hmm. But we're there in case there is, there is an issue, because it's too hard for us three to train all of Bumsy <laughs> right. how to be a proficient, so we just go with them. So is, is it any contraindication if someone had like a stroke or independent hemorrhage six months before they need LVAD, are they, are they excluded? It depends on their level of functionality too, because I mean, if you, you know, Statistically, if you have one stroke prior, you're going to have another stroke somewhere down the road. It's just statistics, you know. I want to be an absolute contraindication, but we have to see where, why, all that occurred. Do they need IVC filters, or anything like like that? It all just kind of just depends on the situation. Yeah. But I wouldn't say no all all told, but it would be a higher risk. It's all to the doctors that they want to manage that long term, and a surgeon because if you stroke once, go on the you know heart lung bypass machine, you may stroke intraoperatively, and then you're in a place where you can't do anything afterwards. So it's kind of things we all look at during the whole eval process before they're approved 
or denied an, an LVAD. But this, this is not, you know, regular medicine, of course. You got to be vote, essentially voted on in our committee meeting and approved for it. Yeah. How much is longest someone has ever been? Our longest? Uh, let's see, he's had his since 2008. And so, longest ever, I think, is right at eight years with a heart mate, too. Um, the only issue is with this is, you know, heart transplants, you know, we've known for, you know, like, what, 40, 50 years now, I think it's been? Heart mate, too, has only been in people for, I think, eight years since the actual device trials. So we just don't know how long it, it will last for. We just don't. So that patient is not tender for transplant? No, oh, he is. He is. Mm -hmm. okay. He's just, he's raising his kids, he's doing just fine, so he's choosing to delay transplant. Because on average, an actual heart will last you 12 to 15 years. And he's 38. So in 12 years, he'll be 50. So if you can get more R plus B, you know, kind of is, the more time you get on your LVAD, delay transplant, unless of course the patient just wants a transplant, then we'll, we'll try and find them one, of course. But we have a lot of folks who are inactive on the list because they're riding their Harleys, they're traveling, they're working full time on these devices. The only thing that they can't do is go, is go, is go swimming and take a tub bath. They can shower, they can travel, they can work full time if they so choose, we, they can drive, we encourage all that stuff. For sure. Yep. I have just a couple of nursing questions. Yeah, go. The ICU nurse uh, mentioned a self-test that they do every shift. Oh yeah. Is that something we're going to be doing mm -hmm. here? Okay. Yeah, all you do is the self-test kind of tests the functionality of the controller. You hold the battery button down until it makes a lot of noise. And then I'll say, right here, I'll, I'll say a cell test. All the lights will come on. Then it takes 15 seconds. You can't silence this. And then, when it's done, <laughs> you passed. So you have to do it when I'm not around. <laughs> Don't do it until the morning, you know. I know. So we're going to be paying attention to map, mm -hmm. more than blood pressure, and yeah. where should we keep our maps? And did we talk to you about that? On her, yeah, pressure? on her, really, because she is so small and everything else, and the bad, she probably never had a normal blood pressure to begin with, because mm -hmm. she is a very tiny person. Um, so, you know, anything really above 60, just to perfuse the brain, is going to be good for her. I mean, just use such a small pulse pressure, so that 68 over 50 is a very small window, but her map is going to be somewhere, right, what's the, what's the, two of the diastolic plus one of the, that's probably about right around 64, I'd say. So it'd be, it'd be fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, it's always look at them, are they lethargic? What's their mentation? Check their map. If it's really low, and we're going to do fluid, fluid, fluid. And yeah. she's a little tricky if she's on dialysis because her fluid status yeah. is going to be up yeah. and down anyway. So I'm, I'm assuming you, that she's going to be completely managed by renal and mm -hmm. radiology in terms of her fluid status. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, tricky. The Doppler pressures, mm -hmm. um, are we going to be doing that only? Is that how we record her? You can do it either way. Like she said before, you know, maybe do one each shift to kind of correlate. Uh -huh. And then Watch if, if you get one with the Doppler and it's really close, would you go to non-invasive? Uh -huh. Then use a non-invasive. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times, on the, even on the 4 and 10 Roberts, they use the cuff and it's really accurate okay. nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's on 10 Roberts. Well, no. she's not. No, she's but not. patients who go to 10 Roberts. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're, she's in the ICU. Is she awake and mentating? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's been there for, I think, almost four months now. Did she so, get a transplant at the end? Once she recovers, we'll have to cross that bridge. Because um, she may need a renal transplant also. It's a whole big thing. Okay. She had a baby, and then her heart mm -hmm. just stopped pretty baby much. Okay? Nope, baby's four months old. And so her poor husband, John, 
she was here, baby was over at Harris Fort Worth, and he was going back and forth four times a day because the insurance wouldn't transfer the baby over here because it's the same level of NICU. So they said run my baby with ambulance because so we had to write letters and fight for the baby transfer. So he didn't have to drive. Because he'd be here seeing his wife during her feeding times, so he had to go take care of baby, come back to take care of wife, he had to go to work, take care of himself, learn all this. So he's just been a whole trooper. He's a, he's amazing, yeah. His name's John, he's really cool. Nice nice guy, so yeah, for sure. But we're, there are times we didn't think she was going to make it. But she pulled through. She was awesome. So, yeah. I wish you had a picture of a real person with Albert so you can show it to us. Ah, yeah. I probably do. Yeah, I was trying to get my volunteer to come, but she was out of town. So she couldn't make it. I think it's on. Uh, let's see here. I should play that today. <laughs> Okay. This is what we do for our. I can send this also if y'all want to see it, but we won't go through the whole thing. This is what we do for all of our patients who are thinking about getting it. We'll skip all this stuff. Yeah, we got the oh, therapy no, folks no. waiting out there too. So. It covers both the devices that we do use. Therapy, for their in service. So, okay, so this is kind of what we have. This is, of course, Paul heard about Dick Cheney had a bad for a good year and a half. Not from us. This is one of our guys, George Nelson. He's had his for almost four years, and he's one of our GI believers. But he still lives and travels all over the world. He's been to the Hawaii, Boca, Colombia, all that kind of good stuff. So this is one of our patients. This is before I came here. She's since been transplanted, but you can kind of see her battery pack sort of right here while she does her cardiac rehabilitation. Yeah. Then, excuse me, if you want to do some yard work, <laughs> if you can. That's awesome. So this guy, he since, had, he since has passed away, but when he passed away, he was a good 88 years old. So nice long life, but here he is. He's painting his fence, things he couldn't do. Beforehand, uh, there he is again. He's mowing his yard. So our patients who have transplant, but he's doing the only thing they want to do, really. And then, of course, this is Dr. Shelley Hall. She's her favorite thing is you know, we never knew many people in our care had these like little tractor things. But here he is on his ranch in his tractor. And then we had one of our patients in Lubbock say, "Do you call that a tractor?" So this is his tractor. <laughs> so here he is. He's actually out there working his land, plowing his field. And you're going to see right if you look close, there's his controller. And he keeps his batteries in a little, like, fishing type vest. Well, they're out there working the land, planting crops for hay for cattle, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, these are kind of more of the Thoratec demos. I'm not sure how accurate it can be if you're playing golf with an LVAD, but I have had folks that do play golf. If you want to get down and dirty, Plant flowers, you can. It's not going to hurt anything. Just don't get it inside the connections. Then here's one of our guys who likes to go fishing. And obviously, we don't recommend going into a boat into the lake because it tips over infection risk. Stuff's not waterproof. Uh, this is one of our guys. He named uh, Victor Norman. He is about three weeks post implant, but he had tickets to the Motor Speedway to meet. Uh, I think it's Mark Martin. I'm not big in NASCAR, but he is. So here he is with his little rollator, walking the inside track. That was his goal. So I get my elbow and I want to go to my my race and meet my favorite driver. This is our guy, uh, one of my favorite patients. Sorry, but I have favorites, but whatever. <laughs> here he is riding his Harley. Now, granted, if you're on Coumadin on a motorcycle with no helmet, but here he is, you know, living his life. That's what he wants to do. He came in, he had a heart attack in Waco. Came. Actually, I think he came here. Then he coded here for about four years ago. Got an LVAD. He actually woke up with his LVAD. Didn't know anything about it because he's on a balloon pump and all that kind of stuff. But he went back to work. He works for Lucky Martin Fort Worth. He works 80 hours a week, seven days a week. He rides Harleys and he's delaying transplant until he's ready for it. He's 57 now. Yeah. So motorcycle riding. Remember guys, 
you know those three wheel motorcycles? They do all these like bike tours, Sturgis, the Carl Mountains, all kinds of fun stuff. Oh, here's our, our same patient, this is George Nelson. He and his wife Carolyn, this is in front of Berlin, from the Brandenburg Gate. So you can see right here his batteries are his little fishing vest type thing. And he just travels the world. There is the connection coming out. I don't really understand so, how to figure it out. Yeah, his yeah. controller he holds in a pocket right here that goes underneath his shirt. So it's coming out here on the on the right on his right side. Okay. And where is the the, the drive line? Yeah, that's that drive line. So his is kind of sitting like this and then through under under his vest it's coming out about like right here. So he has a good foot and a half or so of drive line loop to go from there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can work in cars, again, all that good stuff. One of our patients, he likes to race and jump dune buggies on Coumadin. He knows. <laughs> I mean, they do whatever they, they wanted to do. I mean, I'm not going to, hey, I thought it was like a whole lot, lot, lot of fun to me. I'll do that, but... I know, but I hope you tell them that you're doing that. Oh, no. Doing that. He knows. But I mean, if that's what you love to do, that's why we do these things, is to get back to your patient's life. And then, of course, one of our younger patients, she's 24, but they are Disney World, traveling, living life. And that's, that's Megan and Destiny. That's our 24-year-old. And that's... Our main volunteer, Linda, and that's all, all the, well, CJ, the redhead, she's a lung coordinator now. That's our three. Which one is Megan? Megan's the blonde, Katie's the brunette, I'm the tall dude in the back. <laughs> in case you didn't know.